A young man falls in love with the girl of his dreams. I mean, they are perfect for each other, except for one minor problem. She is an Ohio State fan, and he is all Michigan Wolverines. I mean, he is a maize and blue guy. So before asking to marry him, the guy decides to have to make the ultimate sacrifice and switch over. <coughs> Become a Buckeye fan. He visits his doctor and asks if there's any easy way that he can do this. And the doctor replies, oh, well, yes, it's a very simple procedure. What we do is we go in and we remove half your brain. <laughs> and when you wake up, you'll become an Ohio State fan. Well, the man really loves this gal, and so he agrees to the operation. He goes into surgery next week, and then afterwards he's in recovery, and the doctor comes to him and approaches his bedside, and he says this, I apologize, there has been a mix-up. Instead of removing half your brain, we removed three quarters of it. How do you feel? The man sits up and he looks around and he says, go Spartans. <laughs> and I see I hit someone with that one. <laughs> I think we better go to the Gospel of St. John and take a look at Scripture this morning. And you can do that uh, with our insert. Uh, John, he was really a unique figure in the church. A former fisherman. A fisherman. And Jesus calls him to be a disciple and to share the good news he, he left his profession to do this. And if you study John in the scriptures, you know that it was John with his brother James and, uh, and Peter who went up to the mountaintop on what we call the transfiguration. And he saw Jesus and he saw him transformed in a radiant light. This is the same John, um, the only disciple who followed Jesus and stood by him at the cross. I mean, it was John who raced with Peter to view the empty tomb on that very first Easter. And it was John, you may not know this, but it was John who was spared a martyr's death while all other, the other ten disciples, uh, they perished because of their faith and Jesus, um, as far as we know, John was the only disciple who lived out his life and he died of natural causes. Church history tells us that John lived out his final days in the city of Ephesus. He was frail and old and he could not walk to a gathering for church. And so literally, members of the church would carry him so that he could be part of the worship, so that he could share with them uh, as a preacher. And just before his death, he would say to the congregation, little children, love one another. Love one another. Love one another. And after a few gatherings, some of the members, they grew tired of hearing John continually say, love one another. And uh, they said to him, well, Master, why are you telling us this? Um, and his reply was, it is the Lord's command. If this alone be done, it is enough. Now, bear with me. I mean, this is church legend. Uh, it's not in your Bible. This is tradition passed down through the centuries. But in my heart, I sense this is what happened. 
I believe this. Which brings us now to the scripture text uh, um, printed in your insert. Jesus is speaking to the disciples. John is there, obviously, because he records this. Uh, it's the evening of our Lord's betrayal. They've had their last meal together. Judas, he's left to meet with Caiaphas and collect his uh, ill-gained wages. <laughs> They're in the upper room. And it's quiet, and now Jesus looks at them and he speaks in verse 34. <clears throat> now I'm giving you a new commandment. Love each other. Just as I have loved you, you should love each other. Your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. Now, I, as I'm reading this and preparing for the message, I found it interesting that when the disciples heard this commandment from Jesus, uh, they were silent. They didn't question Jesus. They didn't ask him, well, what do you mean by this? Uh, uh, how do we love each other? Um, how, how does this prove to the world that uh, we're disciples of Jesus? Uh, no one asked our Lord to explain the hows or the whys of loving one another and why it is so important. And then in chapter 15 of John's Gospel, beginning with verse 12, Jesus returns to the topic of love and again, he reminds the disciples. Again, this is my commandment. Love each other in the same way I have loved you. Hmm. In June 1967, during the height of the Vietnam War, there was a live TV special broadcast around the world via satellite originating from from England from Great Britain and that broadcast was called Our World. It was a two and a half hour musical special and it featured dozens of uh, singers and rock groups and opera and classical music. I, it was an amazing event 25 countries watched this on television. And I think because the war was going on, the producers thought that maybe music is the answer. Maybe music can stop the war and bring peace. Nearly 700 million people watched this show. And if you missed it, go to YouTube, Google, our world, and you can watch it. It's, it's, it really is something. One of the most famous segments took place at the close of the broadcast. The Beatles were asked to provide a song with a special message to the world. And the producers said to the Beatles, make it simple, something that everyone can understand in the 25 countries we're broadcasting to. And they perform their song, All You Need Is Love. <laughs> that was the first time they sang that. All You Need Is Love. Maybe you heard it. <laughs> All You Need Is Love. A simple message. This is the message from Jesus. Only his message goes so much deeper. And in John's Gospel, we learn, we learn precisely what Jesus was teaching. Because all we do need is love. Let's, let's begin. And I call my first point a sacrificial love. And we're back to John chapter 15. And Jesus states that if we are to live a life of love... Possess it with all of our being, then we must first experience a death. Now that seems a little radical, but verse 13 says, 
There is no greater love than to lay down one's life. To die for one's friend. Proof that our love for someone is genuine uh, is not that we switch from maize and blue to scarlet and gray. That does not prove that we love that person. The proof is that we are willing to die for the one we love. 2,000 years ago, in a few short hours, this verse would be vividly portrayed. Jesus would go to the cross and he would die for those he loves. <laughs> if I asked, what does this verse mean for today's Christian? Well, someone might reply, we're to follow in the footsteps of Jesus, imitate his life, and be willing to die for my faith, our faith. Well, that really sounds good, doesn't it? We may even be able to say with some conviction, well, I will die for my faith in Jesus. I mean, after all, the prospect of our dying for another person, let's face it, it's pretty remote. So what we're really saying is my intentions, my motive is that I would die for you, but it probably is not going to happen. <laughs> the hard truth is that if, it, if we are ever in the situation confronted with the prospect, the reality that I'm going to die for a person, we'd crumble. Most of us would. We would back off. <laughs> That's just the way it is. True story. I was pastoring in Ohio, my first church. I think it was the third year I was there. And my wife and I, we were shopping. Now, they don't do this in Michigan, but where we lived, when you went shopping and as you checked out, they would take your groceries, bag them up in paper bags, there was no plastic then, and they would place them in the shopping cart and they would push them out to the car for you and then return the cart. It was a wonderful service. Now remember, we had finished our shopping, this young boy was pushing the cart and I was walking alongside him uh, as we approached our vehicle and as we walked, he said to me, well, I sure hope the rest of the day goes better. Now, that's an invitation, obviously, for me to ask him, well, what happened? What's, why are you having such a, a bad day? And he told me the story. And early in the morning, a customer had a heart attack uh, in the store. <coughs> And this is before the, you know, you had the portable machines. And, uh, but one of the employees had taken a CPR class. And so he was trained for this kind of a emergency. And so they called for him. And when he saw the man lying in the aisle, he froze. By the time the EMT unit arrived, the man who was trained in CPR was just sitting there sobbing. He didn't do a thing, and the man died. I mean, how, how sad. A store clerk trained in CPR, he had graduated from the class, they gave him a little diploma that said he could perform this procedure, and then it happened, and a man died in the store, and he could not help him. He froze. He crumbled. Hmm. We, have, we have men and women in the church who are certain that they will vote for Jesus every single time, under any trial, and then the crisis hits, and they crumble. Hmm. The kind of love Jesus is speaking of involves a willingness to die 
for our faith. And this requires that we have this spiritual death. Paul wrote this in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. He said, my old self has been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. So I live in this earthly body by trusting in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. My old self crucified with Christ. What does this mean? God's word is telling us that as Christians, we are no longer self-centered, but Christ-centered. We are no longer seeking our will, but God's will. That selfish, egocentric, greedy person we once were, that's gone now. It's, it's behind us. It's been put to death. We've allowed God to take control of our life. His spirit has filled us. We love God with all of our heart. <laughs> if my son Derek was here today, he's the psychologist, he would explain it this way. And by the way, I phoned him and asked him to explain it, so these are his words. He said, Dad, it's the integration of the human personality around a central goal in life. You are no longer trusted by divided loyalties, but your energies are united for a higher purpose. That's the psychologist speaking. I kind of like uh, the way Paul put it in Galatians. Another true story. Got to go back in time. Barb, you're going to like this one. <laughs> it was my first day as a junior in high school at Western High. And I, some of you have heard the story, but I love telling it. I fell in love with this beautiful blonde. I didn't know her name, but I was certain that we were meant for each other. So I devised a plan so that I could win her heart. I followed her to her next class and I decided whatever class this is, I am going to switch one of mine and take this class. It was Typing 101. <laughs> and I'll be honest with you, I had absolutely no interest in typing. But I really wanted to win this girl's heart. All my energies were focused on this one thing. So I went and I transferred to Typing 101. And I got there early and I, t I got a seat sitting next to her. And I learned her name. And we became friends. But I never won her heart. I asked her out for a date and she said no. I enjoyed that class and I learned how to type. <laughs> and I also learned something else. Something about remaining focused on a goal. That taught me a lesson. You, you stay focused even if the end results aren't quite what you want them to be. Hang in there. We Christians need to have focus on Jesus Christ. He must be number one, even if it means we lose everything, if our plans aren't quite what we want them to be. We stay focused on the Lord. He's number one. Hmm. Let's talk about a loyal love. We read in John 15, 14, Jesus explains love. You are my friends if you do what I command. Now this is unquestionably a loyalty and obedience to Jesus. He's telling us something to do and we do it. 
And did you notice when we're serving the Son of God with all of our heart, Jesus calls us what? A friend. Now the, the word friend, that, that has a great meaning. I want to be a friend of God. If you read your Bible, you know about the guy in the Old Testament. His name is Abraham. And what did God call him? His friend. Abraham was a friend of God. That word friend has great meaning. And the emphasis of this word deals with an intimate love. A relationship with God as a friend is not that we are a slave to God or that he's cracking a whip over our head, uh, but we're friends and we're gladly at his service. We will do anything that Jesus asks us to do. He said, you are my friends if you do what I command. There was a magazine article, that, or a magazine, I'm sorry, that once offered a prize for the best definition of a friend. And they had thousands of entries. And these were the finalists. Again, the magazine offering a prize for the best definition of a friend. One who multiplies joys, divides grief, and whose, honest, whose honesty is undeniable. One who understands our silence. A volume of sympathy bound in cloth. A watch that beats true for all time and never runs down. Here's the winning definition. A friend is the one who comes in when the whole world has gone out. Mm. A true friend. It, it's a person who will be there for you when everyone else abandons you. Have you ever been there? And you feel like all's lost? And then one person comes in Maybe they sit down with you and they just seem to say the right words. Sometimes they don't say anything. It's just their presence. And it helps. Christian love involves this type of obedience. If we're God's friend, I, I love the old hymn, listen, we, we trust and obey, we listen and obey. Hmm. Whatever God wants from us, whatever God's spirit instructs us to do, guess what? We do it. Let's talk about a giving love. And, and what we're talking about, it all ties in with giving. Uh, if we really are who we say we are, followers of Jesus, Christians, then we are involved in giving. John talks about it, or Jesus does, uh, John 15, beginning with verse 16. You didn't choose me. I chose you. I appointed you to go and produce lasting fruit so that the Father will give you whatever you ask for using my name. And, and then here it is. Jesus ties it all in with this message of love. What does he say? This is my command. Love each other. If we love according to Jesus, then you give. Love and giving. I don't think you can separate the two. I appointed you, Jesus said, I appointed you to go and produce lasting fruit. Now that's from the New Living Translation of the Bible. So I, every now and then I like to go to Peterson, see how he translates uh, this passage. And this is what, how he reads it. You didn't choose me. Remember, I chose you and put you in the world to bear fruit, fruit that won't spoil. As fruit bearers, whatever you ask the Father in relation to me, he gives you. But remember, the root command, love one another. I think he nailed it there. Oh, we need to produce fruit. And Peterson said, and I, I agree with him, fruit that doesn't spoil. That's spiritual fruit. That's eternal fruit. 
It's all about giving. Jesus has called us, has commanded us. We are ordained uh, to give sacrificially. Share what we have. When I was pastoring a church near Lansing, I, I, I love that I can share with you all these stories about other churches. You know? <laughs> because you don't know the people. <laughs> and I, I will never share a, a story about something that happened here, unless it's positive. <laughs> but I, I, as I was preparing this message, I remember uh, with the youth leader, we had a youth group of about, oh, I don't know, eight, ten kids in their teens, and we took them to the city rescue mission of Lansing. It's still there, inner city, Christian organization. And they take care of the homeless and they feed them once a day, for, uh, they give them a lunch. And so we volunteered and to, with our kids to serve lunch at the mission. This mission is located one half mile east from the Michigan State Capitol. I mean, what a contrast. I remember I was standing outside of the mission, looking down the road, down the street, six blocks, and you could see the, the Capitol building and the dome and everything. And I remember thinking, here I am in Lansing. I mean, there is, there is the state power. There's, they have all the resources to help the homeless in Lansing, only six blocks away. But what this little mission was doing, I think was greater than anything Lansing could provide. Because not only was the mission helping the homeless, but they were sharing them eternal food, sharing them Jesus. Wow. And I remember thinking, I doubt the governor has ever taken time to walk out of his office and walk six blocks to see what's happening in, in the city. I doubt that. I, I doubt Snyder knows where it's at. <laughs> so anyway, so we're going back home now, taking the kids back to the church. And I remember thinking, boy, we got so much more than what we gave. And the kids all agreed. I talked to them about it. We got back so much more. We did because Christians who serve and give, they do so because they love. And Jesus said, I have pointed you, I have chosen you to go and produce fruit that doesn't spoil. So it's disheartening when I meet Christians who produce zero fruit. I mean, it's sad. We profess that we love Jesus, but we don't produce any fruit. Uh, some of us barely make it to church, and I'll tell you, I applaud you guys for being here this morning because it was a nasty day, and you're here. We get involved. And we give of ourselves. And yeah, we sacrifice because we love. And you get so much more back from God. <clears throat> I'm almost finished. I got one more story to tell you. <laughs> hey, it's just us here this morning. A little group. True story. A missionary doctor in a remote part, part of Africa. This is, oh my, 30, 40 years ago this took place. But the doctor, missionary doctor was there. And his specialty was uh, cataracts. And uh, he had this one person who was blind, almost blind, and he did that operation and uh, the man could see and he was just delayed. He, it was a miracle, he, he could see again. A few weeks later, 48 blind men came to the doctor from in the jungle, deep in the jungle, and they were holding onto a rope guided by the man who had once been blind and his cataracts had been removed. One man, once blind, 
now was sight, and he was anxious to bring others to the doctor who could help him. We are surrounded by people who are blind spiritually. They need Jesus. And, and yet, some of us, we, we're afraid to open our mouth. Yeah, I know that it's difficult. People are, can be hostile and uh, it can be discouraging. You invite, nobody comes. But it's our mission to work for the kingdom. In 1984, Steve Green recorded a song, The Mission. And we sang the chorus this morning for you as we opened our service to love the Lord our God is the heartbeat of our mission in Dearborn, the spring from which our service overflows across the street or around the world. The mission is still the same. Proclaim and live the truth in Jesus' name. I'd like to think that one day we're going to say, Lord Jesus, mission accomplished. And amen.